Hi, College Church. We miss you. We miss yeah, hello again, and, and we desperately need to be back with you and uh, look forward to the time we can gather once again and worship together. Let's begin our worship service by listening to the prophet Micah. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives transgression? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sin underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Let us worship our merciful God. my 
this morning, we want to invite you into a time of reflection. Um, we're going to reflect on whether or not um, we have lived as the Lord loves us and also as he taught us to love in response. This comes from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Am I willing to endure trying people? Love is kind. Am I thinking or acting unkindly toward anyone? Love is not possessive. Am I manipulative? Do I use people? Love is not boastful or proud. Do I love to be the center of attention? Love is courteous. Am I considerate, thoughtful, warm? Love is not selfish. Am I always insistent on my needs and rights? Love is not irritable or bitter. Am I forgiving? Do I keep a record of wrongs? Love delights in truth and righteousness. Do I put obedience to God first in my life? Father God, we confess to you this morning that it is not always the case, Lord, that we love the way you taught us to love by loving us first. We come as ourselves this morning and we rely on your transforming power to change us, to mold us, to bear this fruit, to be love to many people. But Lord, we need your power to break the chains in our hearts. So we cry out to you this morning, break every chain. Jesus. His power in the name of Jesus. 
morning, we pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. This we pray in your name, Jesus.
Amen. Hey, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. My name is Bill Hodgman, and I get to be the pastor of College Church. And if this is your first time, we're, we're just really glad that you found us. We would love to connect with you. Uh, right below the video, there's a link uh, to a little uh, online communication card, and you can just click on that link, let us know who you are, or you can email uh, info at thecollegechurch.org. Let us know how we can help you connect with ministries, with a small group, with the sources of care and support. We'd love that. Yesterday was the Terrace Trails Work Day, and we had a great turnout. It was a beautiful day, so thank you uh, to those who came out and lent a hand. Uh, our Fall Cleanup Day is happening this Saturday, November 14th, beginning at 8.30 a.m. This is a safe opportunity to get together, to work side by side, to make our campus beautiful, to prepare for winter, to show our neighbors how much we love one another, to show our neighbors how much we love them. Uh, God has given us an incredible gift in this campus, and we want to steward well. Um, these uh, spring and fall cleanup days that we do every year uh, save us thousands of dollars that we can then invest in ministries locally and around the world. Plus, you know, it's just fun. So bring your kids, bring your grandkids, a rake, gloves, and we'll see you on Saturday morning. Tonight, the youth group is meeting in person. This is for students in grades 6 through 12. Uh, bring a mask, uh, bring a chair, and we'll provide the s'mores and hot chocolate, and we look, we look forward to seeing you tonight. Uh, we're going to pray, but first, a brief message from our spiritual life coach, Helga. Let's watch. Hello, good morning. I am Helga. Hans and Franz could not make it because they are too sissy, but I am here to pump you up. So you sitting at home watching the church on TV, gaining the COVID-19, you feeling the social distance from God, yeah? You pick up your Bible and you put it down, yeah? Well, I am here to pump you up. And now I have for you exclusive offer, the new soul pants. Like the Bible say, Lord, my soul pants for you. These pants, they keep you from being spiritual sissy, okay? Wear them now and believe me later, they will pump you up. Helga, not not um, not quite how the verse goes. It's uh, as the as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. Go back inside, you sissy. Yeah, I have to preach inside because it's so cold out. Yeah, not if you pumped enough to wear the soul pants. And now I tell you about our sponsor. He been quenching the thirst. I don't know if soul pants are the answer, um, <laughs> but Helga's right about one thing. Uh, this is not the time to let our spiritual lives go. We need to be spiritually alert and engaged, especially in a pandemic when so many of our rhythms and habits are just out of whack. Uh, as we move into winter, our options may narrow, uh, but our lives don't have to get smaller. Right now, we can seize this season to cultivate new and deeper spiritual habits, uh, you know, many of us have been cultivating spiritual habits for years. We've been setting aside specific times during the day to, to connect with God by studying and meditating on his word, by praying and listening to him. Perhaps, you know, some of us, our, our routines, our schedules have been so disrupted, um, and we haven't been making God a priority in the season. Or maybe you love Jesus, but you've never established a daily habit of spending time with him. This is a great time to say, you know what? This next season's going to be really hard, and I don't want to face it alone. I don't want to face it in my own power, in my own wisdom. I need the company of Jesus. I need his grace. I need his leadership. I need his peace. So let's pray. Gracious God, what a joy it is to know you, to trust you, to follow you, to be called your children. You are the vine. We are the branches. And as we make our home in you, we bear fruit. Help us to remain in you, especially in this season, to pant for you like a deer pants for water, to miss you when we lose track of you, to hunger and thirst for your presence and guidance. These are serious times we're living in, and we want to be found faithful and fruitful. We want a joy that transcends our circumstances. We want a living hope that sustains us and, and energizes us and provokes people to ask, 
what it is we're all about. So keep us close to you in this season, that we might desire more and more the things that you desire and do the things that Jesus would do if he were living our lives. God, we've just come through a long election week, and Americans are experiencing it differently. We pray for a peaceful transfer of power in the coming months. We pray for humility and unity in both victory and defeat. These past four years have surfaced deep divisions in our nation, and so we pray for healing. In the days and weeks ahead, help us to listen to you, to discern your voice, how you're calling us to live out your heart in the world. Keep making the gospel real to our hearts so that we can offer an authentic and gentle answer to those who disagree with us, to those who would seek to harm us. Prepare us to make sacrifices for the sake of the most vulnerable in our neighborhoods, in our congregation, in our world. Give us eyes to see the opportunities that we have to make much of you, to build one another up, and to be instruments of your peace. We pray in the name of our Prince of Peace, Jesus. Amen. A reading from Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. A reading from Romans 5. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ? This is the word of the Lord. Well, this morning we are beginning a new sermon series called The S Word, The S Word being sin. A few people approached me in recent weeks to say, well, after the heaviness of the last sermon series, the next sermon series is going to be really light, right? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Let's, um, let's, let's just start by acknowledging the fact that for many people in our culture, sin is a bad word. Some would say that the word sin is old-fashioned. It's regressive, that it's just past time to move on from this antiquated concept. Others would argue that the word sin is inherently exclusive and judgmental, and that there is no place in a pluralistic society like ours that's already fragmented and frayed for, word, for a word like sin. It just throws gasoline on the fire. And I can sympathize with that perspective. After all, words like sin have been weaponized to demonize and exclude individuals and groups of people. For many, uh, the word sin feels like an accusation. It feels like being hit over the head with a blunt object, which is why we need to become people of the gentle answer, people who recognize that the line dividing good and evil cuts through the center of each of our hearts. Sin is not something that exists only out there, inside of other people. Sin is in me, and therefore I have no right to look down on or condemn anyone. Rather than brandish the word sin as a weapon, we ought to consider it the same way we would a diagnosis. 
To say there's no place in a pluralistic society for a word like sin is a lot like saying, well, there's no, there's no place in an anxious hospital for a word like cancer. In fact, people go to hospitals in order to get an accurate diagnosis. A good diagnosis is never intended to condemn a patient, but to shed light on their condition so that they can pursue a cure. A sound diagnosis is the first step toward healing. It's a source of hope. And we ought to consider the word sin in the same way. Historic Christianity teaches that it is impossible to understand the world or yourself without the concept of sin. Now, Christian, the Christian story doesn't start with sin. It, it starts with shalom. Shalom is a good word. Shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, delight. It's a state in which everything relates to everything else in perfect harmony where all of our relationships with God, with each other, with creation are just as they should be. And we were created to enjoy and contribute to shalom. But then sin entered the world. Our first parents were tempted to reject God's authority and to find good and evil for themselves. And when they did, the world broke. Relationships broke. Shalom, that beautiful tapestry, began to unravel. In the Christian worldview, sin is an invasion. It's an anomaly, an intruder. It's a spoiler of goods. Sin doesn't belong here. And yet somehow it's gotten in. And because it's gotten in, the world is not the way it's supposed to be. Work is frustrating and painful sometimes. Relationships get plagued by jealousy and rivalry and distrust. Our inner lives are plagued by anxiety and insecurity and shame. And our way to God is blocked. Cornelius Plananga calls sin the culpable disturbance of shalom. It's whatever human beings do, consciously and willfully, that disrupts the goodness and harmony of creation. Sin vandalizes shalom. It disrupts and pollutes God's good creation. Sin is like graffiti on a piece of art. It's like broken windows on a shop front. It's like cancer in one's bones. Now, the Hebrew scriptures use three words to describe sin, kata, avon, and pesha. And those, uh, these words are, are written in your take-home, and each of them contributes something to the biblical idea of sin. So let's look at them. Kata is usually just translated sin. It's, a, it's an archery term, really, not originally a, a religious term, and it means to miss the mark. It can also be a navigation navigational term that means that you've arrived at the wrong destination. So if sin is missing the mark, what's the mark? Well, listen to how the Bible describes the creation of human beings. God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And the Lord God took the human and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So according to Genesis, God made us in his own image and likeness to rule under him by cultivating and preserving the creation. In other words, to care for the earth and to create culture, to take all the raw materials of creation and arrange them in new ways that help all of life to flourish. And because every human being is created in God's image, then we need to give every single person the honor and respect that they're due. So here's the mark. Serve God's purposes by ruling under God's authority. Honor the image of God in every person and cultivate and preserve creation so that all of life can flourish. That's the mark. And sin, hata, is a failure to acknowledge and submit to God's authority, to find our joy and our purpose in relation to him. Sin is a failure to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and sin is a failure to care for creation. Fundamentally, sin is a rejection of our purpose to love God, 
love others, and sustain shalom. If you look at the Ten Commandments, it's really two lists. Here's how you love God, and here's how you love other people. And Jesus said the whole law, all the prophets, hang on these two commandments. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the mark, and we fall short of that mark all the time. We neglect the poor and the needy so that we can consume a whole bunch of stuff that we don't really need, which in turn creates incredible amounts of waste that pollute and degrade the planet. We fill our lives with distractions, and we occupy our time and numb our minds so that we're less attentive and responsive to the needs around us. We throw people under the bus in order to avoid having to take responsibility for our actions. We use people to get what we want, and on and on and on. To sin is to fall short of the mark by failing to love God supremely and to love others as we love ourselves. That's kata. There's another word, avon, which is usually translated iniquity or guilt. And avon is another word that was borrowed from another context. It just means crooked. It means bent. You know, imagine someone whose back is hunched over and they can't stand up straight. Avon is our tendency to take good things and twist or distort them into bad things. So, for instance, food is a good thing. Our appetite for food is a good thing. Enjoying food is a good thing. But gluttony turns food into an obsession. It turns enjoyment into into compulsion, and it opens the door to greed and excess that deprives the needy and creates a whole host of health problems. Gluttony is a vone. It takes a good thing and it twists it into a bad thing. Wine is a good thing, but drunkenness causes all sorts of problems. Work is a good thing, but overwork leads to exhaustion and loneliness. Rest is good, but laziness prevents us from contributing to our neighbor's good. Anger at injustice is good, but self-righteous anger is destructive. Sexual desire is good, but lust turns people into objects. Power is good when it's used on behalf of the weak, when it's used to serve other people, but power becomes bad when it's used to exploit the weak or disenfranchise people. St. Augustine talks about how evil really isn't a thing that can exist independent of something else. Rather, evil is a parasite that attaches itself to something good in order to twist it, to corrupt it. Avon is misusing or mishandling good things. And the word avon refers not only to crooked actions, but also to the crooked consequences of crooked actions. So, For example, when predatory lending plunges people deeper into poverty, that's avon. When resentments between family members or between nations create cycles of vengeance and retaliation, that's avon. When a series of unwise or destructive decisions leads to feelings of pervasive guilt and shame, that's avon. Twisting a good thing into a bad thing creates natural consequences that are often painful. And that destroys shalom. Now, when you see the word punish in the Hebrew Bible, most of the time that is an English translation of a Hebrew idiom that says, let them sit in or carry their avon. In other words, God gives us the dignity of carrying the consequences of our bad decisions, like when committing a crime leads to incarceration or when dishonesty or unfaithfulness leads to the loss of a relationship. So kata means missing the mark, rejecting our God-given purpose. Avon means crooked or bent, taking a good thing and twisting it into a bad thing. And the third word is pesha. And that word is usually translated transgression, which is a word we don't use a whole lot, but pesha is really a relational term, and it means to break trust with. So if I steal from a stranger, that's theft. But if I steal from my next-door neighbor, that's Pesha. Because we ought to be able to trust our next-door neighbor. When I steal from my neighbor, I not only deprive them of something that's rightfully theirs, I destroy their trust in me. And that Pesha harms not only my relationship with my neighbor, it harms the whole community. Everyone's impacted. Now everybody locks their doors. 
Now everybody's suspicious. Maybe they're less friendly and less hospitable than they used to be. A single instance of abuse in a church affects the whole congregation and their witness in the community. Watergate didn't just end Nixon's presidency and send a few of his associates to jail. It destroyed a generation of Americans' trust in government and led to widespread cynicism and political disengagement. Pesha is sin that destroys trust, that tears the social fabric, that creates fear and suspicion. The prophet Amos calls out the merchants of his day for cheating their customers by using false scales. He accuses merchants of skimping on the measurements, boosting the price, mixing in chaff with the wheat. And these practices not only harm customers, they destroy public trust. And you can't have a healthy, functioning society without trust. You certainly can't have shalom. I used to run a drop-in center for high-risk kids. And very early on, we had an instance of theft. One of the students stole an iPod that belonged to another student. And when we figured out who did it, we sat the kid down and we said, we love you, but you can't come back for a year. And he was totally taken by surprise. He looked at us, he's like, well, can I just give the iPod back? And we're like, yeah, you're going to give it back. But here's the thing, your peers don't feel safe around you anymore. They don't trust you. And this has to be a safe place. So we love you, but we'll see you in a year. We all feel the impact of Pesha every day. We feel it every time we lock our doors. I have a friend who just experienced identity theft, and she said, I felt violated. It wasn't that long ago that an eight-year-old could hop on their bike in the morning and ride around town with their friends as long as they were home in time for dinner. Well, nowadays, most kids have a much shorter leash. Conspiracy theories are a direct result of a loss of social trust. Sin isn't just morally bad. Sin pollutes the environment. It breaks trust, which destroys shalom. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, calls human beings trust breakers. Adam broke trust with God when he rejected God's leadership and then tried to hide from him. He broke trust with his wife Eve when he threw her under the bus and blamed her for his sin. Wonder how long it was before Eve felt safe around her husband again. What I hope that you're starting to see is that biblically, sin is not some moralistic weapon that religious people can use against irreligious people. Sin describes to a great extent why things aren't the way they're supposed to be. It offers an accurate diagnosis of a disease that has to be cured in the world and in our lives if things are ever going to be put right. So a quick recap of these three Hebrew words. Kata, missing the mark, falling short of our calling, failing to love God, to love others, to care for creation. Kata breaks relationships. Avon takes a good thing and twists it into a bad thing. It corrupts and pollutes everything from power to desires. And Pesha erodes trust. It destroys the social fabric and introduces fear and suspicion. And altogether, these three words uh, provide a, a, a clear picture of what the Bible means when it talks about sin. And it shows that sin vandalizes shalom. It vandalizes God's good purposes for the earth and for your life. All right, so why does this matter? Why, why is it so important to understand and name and recognize these things? Well, because if you love creation, if you value relationships and trust, if you want your neighborhood, your community, your country to be places of peace where human beings can flourish, you have to hate sin. Just like you have to hate the cancer that's threatening the life of your loved one. And because you are only ultimately in charge of one life, your own, you should be passionate about rooting sin out of your own heart. If only it were that simple. See, Christianity teaches that sin is a disease that human beings can't cure. When you think about it, that is a self-authenticating fact. This is why communism doesn't work. It's why every utopian experiment fails. 
No matter how hard we try, we can't educate, legislate, or engineer sin out of the human equation. We can't. It runs too deep inside of us. The Apostle Paul says that sin lives in us, infecting and corrupting our desires and compelling us to act for our own benefit at the expense of others. Not only that, but sin poisons us against God. It it causes us to doubt his good and loving intentions for our lives, and so we end up seeking our good apart from him. And the Bible talks about how the, the wages of sin is death. Why? Because sin separates us from God, the God on whom we depend on for every breath. In him we live and move and have our being. We are dependent creatures, and sin cuts us off from the source of all love, all peace, all joy, which is why the story of Jesus is such phenomenally good news. The Creator enters His creation. He becomes a fully human person who embraces and fulfills our calling to love God and love others perfectly. And even though he is subjected to the same weaknesses, the same temptations that we experience, he doesn't sin. And yet, and here's the twist, he takes responsibility for humanity's history of failure. The Apostle Peter, quoting the prophet Isaiah, writes, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. And when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins, our kata, in his body, on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. The Apostle Paul puts it this way, he who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, the one who lived the life that we should have lived died the death that we deserve to die so that we can be reconciled to God and live abundant lives. Prophet Isaiah chapter 53 talks about this this strange figure who is coming, a suffering servant who will come into the world, and when he comes, he will carry the iniquity, he will carry the avon, of many and allow it to crush him. Jesus is crushed by our iniquity. He's overwhelmed and destroyed by it. And yet, he emerges from death to offer his life to us. Instead of letting human beings destroy themselves, God sends his son into the world to absorb the very worst of our Pesha. He experiences betrayal, violence, injustice, Isaiah says of this suffering servant, Jesus, that even though he committed no violence and, had, and no treachery was on his lips, yet he will be counted among those who rebel and break trust, Pesha. He will bear their failures and intercede on their behalf. So through Jesus, God takes responsibility for our Pesha so that he can make it possible for us to become part of a new human race, to become faithful and trustworthy people, people of integrity. That's the kind of human that Jesus was and is. And it's the kind of humans that God wants us to become. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever known someone who was sick and refused to go to the hospital? I have. Sometimes it's because they don't want to find out what's wrong with them. Sometimes it's because they don't trust doctors Sometimes it's because they don't feel like they have the energy to fight whatever battle it is that they have to fight. But it's heartbreaking, isn't it? When someone you love refuses to face the truth, refuses to seek a diagnosis, refuses to pursue a cure, don't be that person. The disease of sin is way more devastating than cancer. It's even more harmful to you, to the people in your life, and to the human community. If you take relationships seriously, you have to take sin seriously. Seriously enough to recognize and understand it and do whatever you have to do to root it out. 
See, real Christians don't point fingers. They don't externalize the problem. They don't specialize in finding fault. Real Christians look within. They pray, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Real Christians seek an honest and accurate diagnosis. If you are stirred by this vision of shalom, of wholeness and completeness, of warm, trusting, harmonious relationships, of human flourishing, don't kid yourself into thinking that we are an election away. We are a new technology away. We're a new job or a new partner away from achieving it. Run to Jesus. Run to the only one who not only hasn't failed, but can forgive those who do. Run to the one whose scalpel is sharp enough, whose hands are skilled enough to give you a new heart, to give you new desires and new priorities and new power so that you can trust and rest in and obey your Creator. This is our story. We are working out our salvation in fear and trembling as God works in us in order to act to fulfill His good purpose. God wants to restore you. He wants to remake you. More than that, He wants to restore shalom through you. But it starts with a diagnosis. In your take home today, there are two spiritual practices listed and described there for you. Self-examination and confession. Self-examination allows you to move from kind of a general diagnosis of sin to a particular diagnosis of the kinds of sins that have taken root inside of your own heart. That's step one, allowing God and his word to search you, to sift you, and to help you become more aware of your weaknesses. Step two is confession, agreeing with God about what's in there and what needs to come out. Confession is a spiritual laxative that allows you to get the poison out of your system so that you can pursue Jesus and his very best for you with an undivided heart. So now is when the real work begins. I mean, this sermon was just kind of setting the table for you. Your job is to work it out. You can do that alone with Jesus, with a journal, with a trusted friend. Just don't become philosophical about sin. People who are philosophical about sin don't change. It has to get personal. And these two practices will help you to make it personal. Please set aside time this week. Set aside some time today to give God space to search you, to know your heart, and for you to come clean in very specific ways. Over the next three weeks, we're going to continue to seek an accurate diagnosis, and a cure. So there's hope on the horizon. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, creating the world and for creating us for good. The world is not the way it's supposed to be. We are reminded of that constantly. And yet we're comforted by the fact that brokenness, the kind we experience inside of ourselves and outside of ourselves, that brokenness is an intrusion on your good creation. Not only that, it has a shelf life. It's been defeated. And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is available to us as we seek to subdue sin's power in our lives. So give us courage in the weeks to come to give our souls a long, hard look. To come clean, to submit to your scalpel, and to seek freedom from the sins and the idols that entangle us. For your glory and for our good, in Jesus' name, amen. This morning I want to introduce a new song. Um, it's called Jesus, Thank You, and it's in response to the message we just heard that Jesus um, took on our sins and that he made it possible for us to be reunited with God. So let's just respond um, to his goodness, his loving kindness.
mystery of the cross. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son. Who drank the bitter cup reserved for me. We're going to sing that one more time. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son. Who drank the bitter cup. Reserved for me Your blood has washed away my sin Jesus, thank you The Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus, thank you Once your enemy Now seated at your table Jesus, thank you so much. He really wants you to be free. He really wants you to have peace. Would you trust him? Trust him like you would trust a surgeon who looks you in the eye and says, I have to take something out of you for you to heal, 
for you to be well. If the service uh, encouraged you, if it challenged you in a good way, uh, click su subscribe, share it with a friend. Uh, if, if you're new to us, we'd love to connect with you. Click that little link below the video. Uh, let us know that you're watching. We'd love to follow up with you. Uh, keep encouraging each other. And let's go with these good words. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Go in peace. Thank you.